how did you become interested in gerontology? That's a good question to start off with. I think I sometimes think that gerontology chose me rather than me choosing gerontology. I actually thought that in my, my first master's degree I was focusing on Montessori education, young children, and I wasn't able to get a job in child care. And so my first social work job was in a chronic care hospital, and the majority of the patients were older adults. And what happened was, um, what I saw really just broke my heart. People were being treated so poorly, the care was so inadequate. If you had asked me what gerontology meant, I would have told you I, did, I had never heard the word before. I was not trained to work with older people, but it just bothered me so much what I was seeing. So it was at that point I decided to go back to school specifically in gerontology. Okay. Um, what's, did you have a particular focus um, in those studies? When I went back to school? When I went back to school, no, because I was really learning about gerontology for the first time. So it was okay. such an exciting time, yeah. learning everything. Everything was mm -hmm. brand new. This was in 1976, I think it was. So everything was brand new. It was so exciting. Um, but I was working, I was going to school at the University of Hawaii, which is a very multicultural state. So I became very interested in understanding more what it means to work in a very multicultural environment and learning about all the nuances and cultural values and all of the challenges that um, race and ethnicity and gender can bring. So my focus became very directed toward looking at marginalized older adults because of that belief in equity that we all deserve to have a good old age, but not everybody has that opportunity. Um, describe your career trajectory as a gerontologist. Okay. Um, well, again, I think it chose me. I didn't choose it. Um, when I graduated with my master's in social work and also public health, my first, I had done an internship in a um, Kukini Medical Center, which is a medical center in Honolulu. It used to be the Japanese hospital of Honolulu until World War II when it wasn't very good to be called the Japanese hospital of Honolulu. So they took the name of the street and it became Kokini. So I worked there for about six years and I directed their geriatric programs. And that was a, a really challenging but a really good experience doing that. Uh, when I left there, I uh, took a job um, working with Dr. Jeanette Takamura at the University of Hawaii School of Social Work. She had a number of grants and needed to hire a project coordinator for one of her grants. So I joined her and loved that experience. And then, interestingly enough, the governor, we elected a new governor who stole Dr. Takamura to be on his cabinet, and there was an opening for someone to teach the gerontology courses. Now, I did not have my PhD at that point, but I was, I guess, in the right place at the right time. So they asked me to stay on and teach the courses. And from there, of course, if you work in a university, you know it's very important to go on and get your doctorate. So at that point, I went back and uh, into a doctoral program. That's great. Um, so at what point in your career did you really embrace the title of gerontologist to describe yourself? I would say it was in graduate school. Uh, when I was in the master's in the, M uh, the MPH, the public health program, the, um, Dr. Tony Lenzer, who was in the School of Public Health, had an AOA grant. Back then, AOA gave grants to give stu stipends to students, and they um, provided a lot of funding for schools to start gerontology curricular programs. So there were about 10 uh, students who had stipends, and we, they really worked a lot with us in terms of coursework, internships. They sent us to conferences. I went to ASA for the first time in 1977 with Dr. Carl Eisdorfer and Dr. Irene Burnside as the speakers. It was in Denver, and I was in awe. They were like rock stars to me because I'd read what they'd written, and I was so thrilled. And they spoke without notes, and of course that just was like, oh my gosh, how can anybody speak without notes? I was so impressed with them. And I think really that was when it just started that I felt so much um, that this was my field. But I'm so grateful that I worked in the field for a few years before because it, frankly, I think it gave the work more meaning. It wasn't just academic. I knew what it really meant for older adults to not get the kind of respect and the care that they so deserved. Um, did you have female mentors 
who impacted your move into gerontology? I think I had a number of mentors who I didn't know very well, but I read what they did and I followed what they did. So people like Maggie Kuhn, who were such fierce advocates, um, you know, peop uh, Lou Glass from the um, Older Women's League, Tish Summers, even people um, who are younger, but Carol Estes, who her work in policy has just been outstanding, uh, Jeanette Takamura. So there have been a number of people who I've just followed. I think as a, as a mentor to me, and always pushing me to do better, I would say Dr. Jeanette Takamura at, the, at Columbia University has always been a very supportive friend and mentor to me. Can you talk mm -hmm. a little more about that? Um, I think it's such a privilege to work with people who are smarter than you are mm -hmm. <laughs> because they push you, right? They have high standards. And if they believe in you as well, it makes you want to just work 300%. Mm -hmm. So she's, um, I find her actually quite brilliant uh, as a writer, as a thinker, as a doer. When she hired me to be a project coordinator for one of her grants, she was the type of administrator that worked right alongside you. And I don't mean as a micromanager, but, but she really engaged herself in the work. So it wasn't, I'm up here and you do the scut work. It was never like that. Mm -hmm. So she, I have really tried to be that kind of administrator to grants I have in mentoring people. I, I hope I'm doing half as good as she did with me. Can you um, just um, discuss a little bit what that project was about? Uh, it, there was, um, I'm trying to remember because it was in the 80s. She had a grant with the NIMH, and it was um, it was education in gerontology, and I'm trying to remember exactly what it was. I know they developed a curriculum in gerontology, and I worked very much getting students to be trained in that curriculum and then following them in their practicum sites mm -hmm. and matching their interests with the sites and so forth. So that was very a very interesting project. And again, it was focusing on mental health, so looking at things like dementia, depression, suicide, alcoholism. So we were focusing on those kind of topics. But within the milieu, which is Hawaii, which is again a multicultural environment, you know, every culture looks at things a little differently, which makes it very interesting, but also challenging. Um, Great. Um, what is unique to you about being a woman gerontologist? That's a very good question. I've never thought about that. Well, I think for one, gerontology is a field where there are women who are leaders. You know, there are, there are some fields, as we all know, that there are fewer than, just look at technology today, there are very few female leaders. But for lots of reasons, I think gerontology has a number of terrific, strong, smart women who are in the field. So I think for a young woman, wow, isn't that fabulous that you get to have mentors who are women who can teach you so many things and who you can just follow and feel proud that you are a woman and you're a gerontologist. So I think, I think younger people are really lucky, um, and I've been lucky myself. Um, how has being a gerontologist interacted with your own personal aging process? You know, it's such an interesting experience either. Sometimes uh, among my friends who are also gerontologists, we chuckle about this because we say, well, we thought we always knew things about aging. We just never thought it would happen to us. <laughs> so, and yet it is, right? So um, my eyebrows are disappearing. I never knew your eyebrows disappeared when you got older. <laughs> so there are things that happen as you get older that you really have to chuckle about and really keep it in balance that we're so privileged, we're so lucky to be healthy and, and living the lives that we do. So we know that, we know it's very, very, we're very, very fortunate. I think it does help prepare you. It helps you appreciate what you have now because the truth is at one point in our lives we will get bad news probably from a doctor or something will happen to us. So it makes you realize how important it is to enjoy your life now and I have to tell you, one of the best things about getting older is things don't bother you. When I was younger, mm -hmm. I worked in academia. It's a challenging environment, academia. So there's a lot of battles going on. And now you go, hmm, I don't think I'm, no, you can fight that battle. I don't think I'm gonna do that one. So you choose things more, um, you're more judicious, I think, with your time and where you want to commit yourself to. So I think it's actually, I'm happier than I think I was in my 30s or 40s where I felt every battle I had to take on and, 
um, which is exhausting when you, when you do that. So I, I'm actually really enjoying where I am right now. Great. The WIGL project focuses on the legacies of older women gerontologists. Within that framework, is there anything else you would like us to know? You know, I, I think I was really lucky when I was younger in that um, my par I came from a modest background, and so I always waitressed. I waitressed all through high school, all through college, different places. And what was very interesting about that experience is very often the restaurants hired women and young women to be out in the front serving the food, but in the back where the really hard work was, the kitchen, the heat, the pressure, it was all minorities, and primarily minority men. So it was Puerto Rican men, it was Chinese men, it was African American men. And what you saw were people who were working so hard, but who were being disrespected. And it opened my eyes to things I'd never thought about before in terms of issues around race, ethnicity, privilege, oppression. And I sometimes think maybe that's what got me into social work, mm -hmm. that it just expanded what I, how I saw the world, because I think I just hadn't ever thought about those issues very deeply at all before. So in looking at that, I guess in a way that's what extended into my work, looking at marginalized populations and social work. So I look at things in terms of who doesn't have the, who hasn't had the opportunity, the resources to have a good old age. And you're looking at certain pockets of the population. You're looking at women as they get older. You're looking at ethnic minorities. Right? So there are populations that are, you're looking at indigenous peoples, so you're looking at people who have not had the opportunities, have not had the resources. And that's propelled me to really focus on these populations within that framework really of equity and fairness that I think is such a core belief of, of social work and I think of gerontology too. Okay, well great, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much.